This episode is brought to you by State Farm. Leaving out the avocado in your salad to save money is not good for morale or your fiber intake. Luckily, State Farm knows the value of the little things. It's why they've got options, like insuring your home and ride with surprisingly great rates on both. Because you shouldn't have to give up what you love for great insurance. For surprisingly great rates, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com for a quote today. Ah, Portugal. There's so much to do, but so little I feel like I have to do when we are here. Talk about a foreign feeling. When we are back from vacation, let's make sure we are still on track with our investment plans. You know, just in case we want to retire here. With Vanguard advice, no matter what your retirement goals are, we can help you get there. That's the value of ownership. Visit Vanguard.com and explore Vanguard advice. All investing is subject to risk. Fund shareholders own the funds that own Vanguard. Services are provided by Vanguard Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Welcome, everyone, to the new 1001 Sherlock Holmes Stories podcast. Here you'll find a collection of Sherlock Holmes adventures, as well as the best of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's stories. Some from our archives at 1001 Classic Short Stories and 1001 Stories for the Road, and some newly produced, all here for your entertainment. Welcome back, everyone, to 1001 Sherlock Holmes Stories and the best of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Today, two short stories for your enjoyment. The first, How It Happened, and the second, An Alpine Pass on Skis by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. She was a writing medium. This is what she wrote. I can remember some things upon that evening most distinctly, and others are like some vague, broken dreams. That is what makes it so difficult to tell a connected story. I have no idea now what it was that had taken me to London and brought me back so late. It just merges into all my other visits to London— but from the time that I got out at the little country station, everything is extraordinarily clear. I can live it again, every instant of it. I remember so well walking down the platform and looking at the illuminated clock at the end which told me that it was half past eleven. I remember also my wondering whether I could get home before midnight. Then I remember the big motor, with its glaring headlights and glitter of polished brass, waiting for me outside. It was my new 30-horsepower Wilbur, which had only been delivered that day. I remember also asking Perkins, my chauffeur, how she had gone, and his saying that he thought she was excellent. "'I'll try her myself,' said I, and I climbed into the driver's seat. "'The gears are not the same,' said he. "'Perhaps, sir, I had better drive.' "'No, I should like to try her,' said I. And so we started on the five-mile drive for home." My old car had the gears as they used always to be in notches on a bar. In this car you passed the gear lever through a gate to get on the higher ones. It was not difficult to master, and soon I thought that I understood it. It was foolish, no doubt, to begin to learn a new system in the dark. But one often does foolish things, and one has not always to pay the full price for them. I got along very well until I came to Claystall Hill. It is one of the worst hills in England, a mile and a half long, and one in six in places. With three fairly sharp curves, my park gate stands at the very foot of it upon the main London road. We were just over the brow of this hill, where the grade is steepest, when the trouble began. I had been on the top speed, and wanted to get her on the free, but she stuck between gears, and I had to get her back on the top again. By this time she was going at a great rate, so I clapped on both brakes, and one after the other, they gave way. I didn't mind so much when I felt my foot brake snap, but when I put all my weight on my side brake, and the lever clanged to its full limit without a catch, it brought a cold sweat out of me. By this time, we were fairly tearing down the slope. The lights were brilliant, and I brought around the first curve all right. Then we did the second one, though it was a close shave for the ditch. There was a mile of straight then, with the third curve beneath it, and after that the gate of the park. If I could shoot into that harbor, all would be well, for the slope up to the house would bring her to a stand. Perkins behaved splendidly. I should like that to be known. He was perfectly cool and alert. I had thought at the very beginning of taking the bank, and he read my intention. I wouldn't do it, sir, said he. At this pace it must go over, 
"'and we should have it on the top of us. "'Of course, he was right. "'He got to the electric switch and had it off, "'so we were in the free, "'but we were still running at a fearful pace. "'He laid his hands on the wheel. "'I'll keep her steady,' said he, "'if you care to jump and chance it. "'We can never get round that curve. "'Better jump, sir.' "'No,' said I. "'I'll stick it out. "'You can jump if you like. "'I'll stick it with you, sir,' said he. "'If it had been the old car, "'I should have jammed the gear lever into the reverse "'and seen what would happen. "'I expect she would have stripped her gears "'or smashed up somehow, "'but it would have been a chance. "'As it was, I was helpless. "'Perkins tried to climb across, "'but you couldn't do it going at that pace. "'The wheels were whirring like a high wind "'and the big body creaking and groaning with the strain.' "'but the lights were brilliant, and one could steer to an inch. "'I remember thinking what an awful and yet majestic sight "'we should appear to anyone who met us. "'It was a narrow road, and we were just a great, roaring, "'golden death to anyone who came in our path. "'We got round the corner with one wheel three feet high upon the bank. "'I thought we were surely over, "'but after staggering for a moment, she righted and darted onwards. "'That was the third corner, and the last one. "'There was only the park gate now. "'It was facing us, but as luck would have it, "'not facing us directly. "'It was about twenty yards to the left "'up the main road onto which we ran. "'Perhaps I could have done it, "'but I expect that the steering gear "'had been jarred when we ran on the bank. "'The wheel did not turn easily. "'We shot out of the lane. "'I saw the open gate on the left. "'I whirled round my wheel "'with all the strength of my wrist. "'Perkins and I threw our bodies across, "'and then the next instant, going at fifty miles an hour, "'my right wheel stuck on the right-hand pillar of my own gate. "'I heard the crash. "'I was conscious of flying through the air, and then... "'And then... "'When I became aware of my own existence once more, "'I was among some brushwood in the shadow of the oaks "'upon the lodge side of the drive. "'A man was standing beside me. "'I imagined at first that it was Perkins, "'but when I looked again I saw that it was Stanley.' "'a man whom I had known at college some years before, "'and for whom I had a really genuine affection. "'There was always something peculiarly sympathetic to me "'in Stanley's personality, "'and I was proud to think that I had some similar influence upon him. "'At the present moment I was surprised to see him, "'but I was like a man in a dream, "'and quite prepared to take things as I found them, "'without questioning them. "'What a smash!' I said. "'Good Lord! What an awful smash!' "'He nodded his head, "'and even in the gloom I could see that he was smiling "'the gentle, wistful smile which I connected with him. "'I was quite unable to move. "'Indeed, I had not any desire to try to move. "'But my senses were exceedingly alert. "'I saw the wreck of the motor lit up by the moving lanterns. "'I saw the little group of people and heard hushed voices. "'There were the lodgekeeper and his wife, and one or two more. "'They were taking no notice of me, "'but were very busy around the car.' Then suddenly I heard a cry of pain. "'The weight is on him. Lift it easy!' cried a voice. "'It's only my leg,' said another one, which I recognized as Perkins. "'Where's Master?' he cried. "'Here I am!' I answered. But they did not seem to hear me. They were all bending over something which lay in front of the car. Stanley laid his hand upon my shoulder, and his touch was inexpressibly soothing. "'I felt light and happy in spite of all. "'No pain, of course,' said he. "'None,' said I. "'There never is,' said he. "'And then suddenly a wave of amazement passed over me. "'Stanley! Stanley! "'Why, Stanley had surely died of enteric at Bloemfontein in the Boer War. "'Stanley!' I cried, and the word seemed to choke my throat. "'Stanley!' "'You are dead.' "'He looked at me with that same old, gentle, wistful smile. "'So are you,' he answered. "'We'll return with our second story "'right after these sponsor messages.' "'Hi, everyone. "'It's a crazy world out there. "'Prices are going up on everything, "'and debt is rising. "'Paying down debt is like playing whack-a-mole. "'You cover one, and another pops up in its place.' If you're tired of juggling due dates, consolidating them into one personal loan could be the answer for you. Credit Karma offers low-interest loans personalized for you. They'll even show you your chances for approval so you can choose between loan offers. Comparing loan offers is free with them, 
It won't affect your credit scores, and it'll save you money and make paying off credit card debt a lot easier and less stressful. But they can also be a big help finding auto insurance, opening free savings accounts, and finding the best credit card. They can save you lots of time and money. Credit Karma, and that's Karma with a K, is a great way to get your financial matters on track for success. Their members save an average of 27% on interest rates. Ready to apply? Give them a visit at creditkarma.com forward slash loan offers, all lowercase, to see personalized offers. That's creditkarma.com forward slash loan offers, all lowercase, to find the right loan for you. That's creditkarma.com forward slash loan offers. Give them a try. When you're smiling. Hey, you. It's me, Michael Buble, for Bubbly Sparkling Water. Bubbly is crisp, light, and refreshing. It's got taste, and it's perfect for any occasion. Keep on smiling. Kind of like my voice, but in a can. No calories, no sweeteners, all smiles. The whole world smiles with you. Bubbly. Crack a smile. Our second story, An Alpine Pass on Skis, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This story shows just how much Doyle enjoyed ski adventures, this one in Davos, Switzerland. It was published in the Strand Magazine in December of 1894. Doyle was an avid sportsman. He boxed, swam, played golf, cricket, and hockey. When he moved to Switzerland in 1893, he took up skiing. It's remarkable that he even tried the sports, since skiing in the Alps was very much in its infancy. In the late 19th century, the numbers of skiers in Switzerland could have been counted on one hand. He had skis shipped to him from Norway and started teaching himself. Eventually, he teamed up with two brothers, the Brangers brothers, described in the story below. The brothers had done a backcountry ski trip over a pass in the Alps, and Conan was hot to have a go at it himself. The following is Arthur Conan Doyle's story of his ski trip. There is nothing peculiarly malignant in the appearance of a pair of skis. They are two slips of elm wood, eight foot long, four inches broad, with a square heel, turned up toes, and straps in the center to secure your feet. No one to look at them would guess at the possibilities which lurk in them. But you put them on, and you turn with a smile to see whether your friends are looking at you. And then the next moment you're boring your head madly into a snowbank, and kicking frantically with both feet, and half rising only to butt viciously into that snowbank again, and your friends are getting more entertainment than they'd ever thought you capable of giving. This is when you're beginning. You naturally expect trouble then, and you are not likely to be disappointed. But as you get on a little, the thing becomes more irritating. The skis are the most capricious things upon earth. One day you cannot go wrong with them. On another, with the same weather and the same snow, you cannot go right, and it is when you least expect it that things begin to happen. You stand on the crown of a slope, and you adjust your body for a rapid slide, but your skis stick motionless, and over you go upon your face. Or you stand upon a plateau, which seems to you to be as level as a billiard table, and then in an instant, without cause or warning, away they shoot, and you're left behind staring at the sky. For a man who suffers from too much dignity, a course of Norwegian snowshoes would have a fine moral effect. Whenever you brace yourself for a fall, it never comes off. Whenever you think yourself absolutely secure, it is all over with you. You come to a hard ice slope at an angle of 75 degrees, and you zigzag up it, digging the side of your skis into it, and feeling that if a mosquito settles upon you, you're gone. But nothing ever happens, and you reach the top in safety. Then you stop upon the level to congratulate your companion, and you have just time to say, What a lovely view this is! When you find yourself standing on your two shoulder blades with your skis tied tightly around your neck. Or again, you may have had a long outing without any misfortune at all. And as you shuffle back along the road, you stop for an instant to tell a group in the hotel veranda how well you're getting on. Something happens, and they suddenly find that their congratulations are addressed to the soles of your skis. Then, if your mouth is not full of snow, you find yourself muttering the names of a few Swiss villages to relieve your feelings. Raggets is a very handy word, and may save a scandal. But all this is in the early stage of skiing. You have to shuffle along the level, to zigzag or move crab fashion up the hills, to slide down without losing your balance, and above all, to turn with facility. 
"'The first time you try to turn, "'your friends think it's part of your fun. "'The great ski flapping in the air "'has the queerest appearance, "'like an exaggerated dance. "'But this sudden wish round "'is really the most necessary of its accomplishments, "'for only so can one turn upon the mountainside "'without slipping down. "'It must be done without ever presenting "'one's heels to the slope, "'and this is the only way. "'But granted that a man has perseverance "'and a month to spare in which to conquer "'all these early difficulties, "'he will then find that skiing "'opens up a field of sport for him "'which I think is unique. "'This is not appreciated yet, "'but I am convinced that the time will come "'when hundreds of Englishmen "'will come to Switzerland "'for the skiing season in March and April. "'I believe that I may claim to be the first "'save only two Switzers "'to do any mountain work, "'though on a modest enough scale, "'on snowshoes, "'but I am certain that I will not "'by many a thousand be the last.' The fact is that it is easier to climb an ordinary peak or to make a journey over the higher passes in winter than in summer, if the winter is only set fair. In summer you have to climb down as well as climb up, and the one is as tiring as the other. In winter your trouble is halved, as most of your descent is a mere slide. If the snow is tolerably firm, it is much easier also to zigzag up it on ski rather than to clamber over boulders under a hot summer sun. The temperature, too, is more favorable for exertion in winter, for nothing could be more delightful than the crisp, pure air on the mountains, though glasses are, of course, necessary to protect the eyes from the snow glare. Our project was to make our way from Davos to Arosa over the Furka Pass, which is over 9,000 feet high. The distance is not more than from 12 to 14 miles as the crow flies, but it has only once been done in winter. Last year, the two brothers Branger made their way across on skis. They were my companions on the present expedition, and more trustworthy ones no novice could hope to have with them. They are both men of considerable endurance, and even a long spell of my German did not appear to exhaust them. We were up before four in the morning, and had started at half-past for the village of Frauenkirch, where we were to commence our ascent. A great pale moon was shining in a violet sky, with such stars as can only be seen in the tropics or the higher Alps. At a quarter past five, we turned from the road and began to plod up the hillsides over alternate banks of last year's grass and slopes of snow. We carried our skis over our shoulders, and our ski boots slung round our necks, for it was good walking where the snow was hard, and it was sure to be hard wherever the sun had struck it during the day. Here and there in a hollow, we floundered into and out of a soft drift up to our waists, but on the whole it was easy going, and as much of our way lay through fir woods, it would have been difficult to ski. About half past six, after a long, steady grind, we emerged from the woods, and shortly afterwards passed a wooden cowhouse, which was the last sign of man which we were to see until we reached Arosa. The snow being still hard enough upon the slopes to give us a good grip for our feet, we pushed rapidly on over rolling snowfields with a general upward tendency. About half-past seven the sun cleared the peaks behind us, and the glare upon the great expanse of virgin snow became very dazzling. We worked our way down a long slope, and then, coming to the corresponding hillside with a northern outlook, we found the snow as soft as powder, and so deep that we could touch no bottom with our poles. Here then we took to our snowshoes, and zigzagged up over the long, white haunch of the mountain, pausing at the top for a rest. They are useful things, the skis, for finding that the snow was again hard enough to bear us. We soon converted ours into a very comfortable bench, from which we enjoyed the view of the whole panorama of mountains, the names of which my readers will be relieved to hear I have completely forgotten. The snow was rapidly softening now into the glare of the sun, and without our shoes all progress would have been impossible. We were making our way along the steep side of a valley, with the mouth of the Furka Pass fairly in front of us. The snow fell away here at an angle, and as this steep incline, along the face of which we were shuffling, sloped away down until it ended in an absolute precipice, a slip might have been serious. My two more experienced companions walked below me for the half mile or so of the danger, but soon we found ourselves on a more reasonable slope where one might fall with impunity. And now came the real sport of snowshoeing. Hitherto we had walked as fast as boots would do over ground where no boots could pass, but now we had a pleasure which boots could never give. For a third of a mile we shot along over gently dipping curves, skimming down into the valley without a motion of our feet, in that great untrodden waste, with snowfields bounding our vision on every side, and no marks of life save the track of the chamois and the foxes, 
"'It was glorious to whiz along in this easy fashion. "'A short zigzag at the bottom of the slope "'brought us, at half-past nine, into the mouth of the pass, "'and we could see the little toy hotels of Arosa "'away down among the fir woods, thousands of feet beneath us. "'Again we had half a mile or so, "'skimming along with our poles dragging behind us. "'It seemed to me that the difficulty of our journey was over, "'and that we had only to stand on our skis "'and let them carry us to our destination.' but the most awkward place was yet in front. The slope grew steeper and steeper, until it suddenly fell away into what was little short of being sheer precipice. But still, that little, when there is soft snow upon it, is all that is needed to bring out another possibility of these wonderful slips of wood. The brothers Branger agreed that the place was too difficult to attempt with the skis upon our feet. To me it seemed as if a parachute was the only instrument for which we had any use, but I did as I saw my companions do. They undid their skis, lashed the straps together, and turned them into a rather clumsy toboggan. Sitting on these, with our heels dug into the snow, and our sticks pressed hard down behind us, we began to move down the precipitous face of the pass. I think that both my comrades came to grief over it. I know that they were as white as Lot's wife at the bottom, but my own troubles were so pressing that I had no time to think of them. I tried to keep the pace with moderate bounds by pressing on the stick, which had the effect of turning the sledge sideways, so that one skidded down the slope. Then I dug my heels hard in, which shot me off backwards, and in an instant my two skis tied together, flew away like an arrow from a bow, whizzed past the two brangers, and vanished over the next slope, leaving their owners squatting in the deep snow. It might have been an awkward accident in the upper fields, where the drifts are twenty to thirty feet deep, but the steepness of the place was an advantage now, "'for the snow could not accumulate to any great extent upon it. "'I made my way down in my own fashion. "'My tailor tells me that Harris Tweed cannot wear out. "'This is a mere theory, and will not stand a thorough scientific test. "'He will find samples of his wares on view from the Firka Pass to Arosa, "'and for the remainder of the day I was happiest when nearest the wall. "'However, save that one of the brangers sprained his ankle badly in the descent, "'all went well with us, and we entered Arosa at half-past eleven, having taken exactly seven hours over our journey. The residents at Arosa, who knew that we were coming, had calculated that we could not possibly get there before one, and turned out to see us descend the steep pass just about the time when we were finishing a comfortable luncheon at the Seahof. I would not grudge them any innocent amusement, but still, I was just as glad that my own little performance was over before they assembled with their opera glasses. One can do very well without a gallery, when one is trying a new experiment on skis. Thanks for joining us today at 1001 Sherlock Holmes Stories and the best of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I hope you enjoyed these two short stories from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Until next Sunday, when we come back with a new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Everyone stay safe, share our show with friends, leave us a review, and we'll be back soon.